Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 223 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on what is structural family therapy. And it's the 5th of August 2023 as I record this. So... Family therapy is definitely an episode I've been wanting to do for ages. I think family therapy, I will never ever be trained in systemic therapy. I seriously will never be. However, I am really interested in the concept of systemic theory and systemic approaches to mental health conditions. I think are honestly fascinating. Because of these look at how well the family system actually in like a drags and if there's conflict between two family members then this conflict can ricochet across the entire family system and cause family problems. I love this theory. I think it's massively true. I know my own experience that it's been true and I absolutely really have been wanting to do this episode for so so long. So by the fact that I've actually finally decided to write it up and do a podcast episode on it I'm really, really pleased. So, you've got that to look forward to in the content part of today's episode. So, we're moving on to the psychology news section. We're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And the first one, I think, is rather fun. Across cultures, men tend to say, I love you, first. Saying, I love you, for the first time can be exciting and anxiety-inducing in equal measure, professing love is often seen as a significant step in a relationship. So being the first to do it can be a terrifying prospect. What if they um, don't say it back? A nightmare scenario in the making, we know. Whilst gender stereotypes may lead us to believe that women are more likely to say, I love you first, new research from a global team of academics suggests this may not actually be the case. Writing in the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships, they find that across Australia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, France, Poland and the UK, men are more inclined to confess first. So there's actually not a great amount I can actually say this, except from two main things. One, I always think sort of relationship research is quite interesting. One, from a personal point of view, because I've never had to do any of like this before. But what is also quite interesting is from a broader sense though, because relationships, we all love our life relationships, we all want them, we all enjoy them. And um, human relationships is a massive part of the human egg experience. So when we do come across psychology research that actually helps us to understand relationships more, I always think it's quite fun because every so often you get a brilliant tidbit or a great tip which you can apply to your own relationships. And then like, the only other thing that I want to comment about this particular article is that it's really good that they've, that they've actually done really quite diverse coaches uh, just so we can understand what is the universal behavioural trend because sometimes behaviours are universal so they're common across all human coaches but other times they're not. So it's really good to see that there are some really different cultures on plenty of uh, different continents. So the next one is mapping misphonia. Not all sound versions are equal. Chewing, slurping, sniffing. If uh, just the mention of those sounds uh, make you cringe, you may already be familiar with misphonia. Misphonia is a recently recognized common addition centered around the hatred of sound. Those that suffer from it typically find themselves reaching anger, revulsion, 
or even panic to sounds that would typically leave someone without misphobia unbothered. Far from just a passing quiff, these reactions can be so extreme and intrusive that they necessitate seeking treatment. This is a backdrop for a recent pre-registration investigation by Norva Adama and her colleagues at University of Sussex, who set out to document the responses of misphonics to a wide set of sounds. In doing this, the team hoped to be able to assess if mis is misphonics have a specific profile of negative responses the sounds that could that could differentiate them from those that would have a sound based sensitivity such as hyperacusis or those seen in autism. So this is another one which I think my reflections on this psychology article are going to be rather short because I'm not really sure what you could say about this because this is such a new area of research because if someone does have a high sensitivity towards sound, but they don't have autism, they don't have another traditional, and I say in air quotes, um, sound sensitivity, then could this be a new mental health condition? I have no idea. It, it says that it's been recently recognised, but it'd be interesting to see, could this potentially make it into the DSM or the ICD-11 or to be honest, 12, yeah, we're like 12 now. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see what comes of this misophonia because if it does leave the people with clinically significant levels of psychological distress and slash or impaired functioning in areas of life, then yes, then this could be a potential mental health condition. But again, I know from my perspective, I'm not sure that this is unique enough, but again, this is a brand new area of research, so we don't know anything about it, or we don't know as much, like I certainly don't, so it'd be interesting to see in the future, will this come back in a future article. So the last one is, could pessimism move the needle on climate further? This summer, we take a dip into our archives to see how ways of communicating the severity of the climate crisis may be received. Way back in 2011, we received that apocalyptic climate warnings can be counterproductive. Messages designed to increase awareness and engagement of the upcoming danger of the climate change backfired and instead made people more skeptical of the warnings they were reading. However, in 2022, Emily Reynolds reported on findings that suggest pessimistic messages about the future may now garner more engagement than those that end on an optimistic note. Nine years of development and psychological adjustment to new norms, perhaps, may have changed how we engage with climate crisis messaging. But with young people around the world reporting higher levels of, of the climate ang ang anxiety, might the pessimism be too much for some? These and other questions remain open, and we'll be sure to digest the developments as they come. So I always think climate crisis messaging is really important because, and I've actually mentioned this tons of, tons of different times before on the podcast, this is why psychology is so important, because we understand human behaviour, we understand um, social processes, we understand cognitive biases, and we understand persuasion psychology. All of these are really important when it comes to the climate crisis. Because we know if we frame messages in like certain ways, then we are risk in like engaging people in denial of our behaviour because the message is simply too scary. But if the message isn't scary enough, that I sort of say not like, echoes, then then basically no one cares. So we always need to find like a balancing act, and it's really good that there is a lot of. Is, is that there is a lot more psychology research in uh, to messaging and uh, climate change um, like messaging because I know that this year, last year in the UK, that was not normal. It is not normal for the UK to be 40 degrees <laughs> and it's really not normal at the moment for it to be raining in August. 
I know that there's all the stereotypes that England always evades, but for starters, we aren't Ireland. Yes, I know that's another um, stereotype. <laughs> but August, I'm 22 now, and it and it has never been raining or muggy this long before so um, it's not really like normal and i've looked into the like weather signs like uh, behind it and it's really like interesting to see how the heat wave in europe is a really like messing up the weather in uh, the uk but it'd be interesting to see what happens for the rest of august hopefully it like heats up but i sort of think that if it does heat up then it is going to get stupidly hot and the uk we do not have the infrastructure like the UK was basically burning like last year because yeah, well because the roads are on fire and such and such. A climate change messaging really in important and and we do need to take this a lot more seriously. Or at least our governments do. So I hope you enjoy the psychology news section. So let's move on to the person update. So we're moving on to the personal update. So this week has been a lot of fun, really, really positive week. Like, oh yeah, like overall though, for quite a few different like, reasons, and only one of them is actually like, psychology related. Though, and I sort of do reference this in the content part of like today's episode, so I won't talk about it like, too much. But because I've been wanting to gain some extra work experience uh, in non-traditional mental health services and that I sort of mean that they're not the normal ones that you normally think about and these are not the really popular ones that often have work experience at places and the infrastructure to handle work a shadowing. So I wanted to do like some of them and I actually talk about what the services actually were in the content part of uh, today's episode and I've been hearing back from quite a lot of them like this week because there's always such a time of delay which I get NHS stupidly busy but it's really nice uh, that they actually seemed really really uh, positive that they really liked that I was passionate about the area and they thought the letters were written really well and I've already got some work experience in September with learning disabilities and because um, when it, especially when it comes to clinical psychology it is really important to actually try and have some work, ex- some work experience under you I think I might do a, a podcast episode in yeah, like after my learning disability work experience because I know that if I had done these letters towards the more traditional services that you do offer like work experience then I probably would have like got some but I might do that in like the future <laughs> so um, any way there like there might be a more of a how-to or more of a tips based podcast episode because of like I found out this week there's a brilliant job that I could have applied for because I met all the criteria except for the fact that I don't have work experience and this is one of the most annoying things i think though and i'm sure that every single young person that can actually back coming up here how are we meant to get psychology jobs because we don't have experience if no one actually gives us the experience in the first place and another problem is that there's only so many um volunteering opportunities about so um, interesting annoying but but really, really interesting times ahead. But moving on to fun stuff. One thing I would like to know from all of you is would you guys ever want psychology merchandise? Because I really have been getting into products um, for my fiction audience, especially in my belly English like mysteries, because of my fiction side, I have a tote bag, a wine tote bag, and there's a coffee travel mug. So I would like to ask any of you, would you guys want that sort of stuff? For, because I would absolutely love to do a like psychology tote bag, maybe even a psychology laptop case. Basically all of those sort of like products. So if you do, and if you are interested, absolutely get in touch with me because I would love to know the sort of um, end night engagement and if there is a genuine interest here because I think that would be absolutely really really fun. 
And as always, I always love to your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can just email me, connorwiley, connorwiley.net. You can always leave a comment and show us at connorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi wiley. I always love to hear from all of you because it always makes the podcast feel more like a conversation. Or to be honest, I suppose I should have probably start to call in like Twitter X, even though I'm flat out not um, for that name change anymore. I barely use a Twitter, but if you guys contact me, I will definitely see it and I will reapply. And today's episode has been sponsored by Social Psychology, a guide to cultural and social psychology. So this is an absolutely brilliant sponsor for today's episode because the systemic approach to mental health conditions focuses on family systems and family related factors. But families and all of the relationships that we have with our families whether it be our siblings, our mother, our father, or any of our chosen family members. But that's all social work processes. And that's all what to do with inner groups and out groups are to various extents. So where that means that we really do need to have a deep un- understanding of how a social processes work and how and how but different social work processes impact our behaviour. So but this great, really easy to understand books helps you to get a, a deep understanding of social processes. For example, the self, the psychology of persuasion, in groups and out groups, and group formation, and how groups stay together. And then it also talks about so many great other topics, so which I really do like recommend. This is a really popular book. Lots of readers like love it, so I really do recommend it. So that is Social Psychology, a guide to cultural and social psychology, available to all major ebook retailers, and you can get the payback and hardback version from Amazon, your local bookstore or local library if you request it. And you can buy the ebook directly from me to playhip.com forward slash Con Wiley. So what was a buying books helps us helps us to support the editing and the creation of the show. My time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And as always, an absolute massive thank you to my patrons because your support shows that you like the show and you want it to continue. So if you want to get tons of great benefits, including early access to the blog post, then you can now become a patron at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. So that's enough the personal update. Let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about what is the structural family therapy. This is an absolute brilliant podcast episode. I'm really, really excited about it. This is going to be a lot of fun. So let's dive into it. What is structural family therapy? Personally, I've been wanting to learn about family therapy for ages so I'm really excited that I'm finally going to to get to learn about this uh, great area. Therefore structured family therapy is a type of a psychological therapy that focuses on relationships and interactions between different family members. It's based on systemic theory that sees the family as a system and if there is conflict between family members they know this impacts the entire family system. As a result, structured family therapists seek to improve a family's communication skills, may encourage changes and rules to adapt to better serve for the family system. In addition, it really is this family structural system that makes this therapy distinctive compared to other therapies as well as a structural family therapist actively engages in the process of a, of a restructuring the way the family system works so that they can adjust the elements that cause the family dysfunction. The restructuring work can impact the reactions of family members to major life changes, family boundaries and hierarchies of power. Personally, I've always really liked systemic therapy, 
Sins of Past, the Cognitive Behavioral Approach will always be my favourite, favourite, as I believe it does explain a lot more about mental health conditions than systemic um, theories and approaches. I really do believe that. I really do love by the idea that the family is a system and a, and a conflict can spread through the family system and that causes a loss of psychological distress for the individual because to be honest I didn't write this in the blog post but I think that's what I like about it. I think unlike the cognitive behavioural approach systemic can actually answer the like questions about how do societal and how do the different family factors impact the individual on well, an individual level because the cognitive behavioural approach basically completely ignores that. So going back to the blog post. Furthermore, a really interesting difference between individual psychotherapies and a structured family therapy is that the family therapy gives everyone in the therapy a voice. It means that a therapist gets to hear about the family hear from everyone and how everyone views each other and their relationship. This gives the therapist a lot more information and a and different angles compared to hearing about the family from only one client. This I think is very useful because the problem that I do sort of say in my air quotes are with any information that come from only one person is that it will always be biased by their own thoughts, feelings and behaviours. Now that flat out is not a bad thing because the therapist can still get tons of good information about a client and their family through this individual work but when we're trying to help an entire family system it is a lot better to hear from everyone. How did structural family therapy develop? It was developed in the 1960s by Munchkin because he believed that the more family members of a therapy that participated the better the treatment outcome for a client could be. And if this therapy continues, it's important in these modern times as one of the main theories behind family counselling. Open quote. The idea of a structural family therapy sprang out of a sense that what we were doing was not working. Close a quote. Egg explained Salvador Marchkin. I'm sorry, that is such a great name. The principal creator of structural family therapy. Open quote. We were all very much orientated towards psychodynamic ori orientated psychological approaches and they didn't work. Close quote. Now, in my opinion, I do understand where he's coming from because back then the cognitive behavioural approach was only just starting to be developed and off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it hadn't been applied to mental health difficulties for quite a while after this was even Beck's depression work I wasn't done until a number of years after this point. Therefore, I do understand the sheer need to move away from psychodynamic approaches, but like all psychological theories and school of thoughts, family therapy does not explain everything. It seriously doesn't. <laughs> as well as this um, family system theory does I completely dismiss the, um, the importance of social factors within romantic and friend of relationships and cognitive factors like thinking, attentional and memory biases. When is structured family therapy used? Now I'm very excited to share some of the reasons why, um, why, uh, why structured family therapy is only used in certain situations since I know in my criticism above, I was being a bit hard on the on the therapy because you really cannot use it for some mental health conditions. But there are some difficulties that this therapy is brilliant at looking at. As a result, structured family therapy is that commonly used in cases of divorce, blending families, drug use, adolescent behaviour, as well as mood disorders. Families where a, a parent has had a mental health condition or when a family is affected by a death or an illness. 
In addition, significant changes in family life. And this is why I'm fl I'm really, really interested in this therapy. Because I'm not really interested in it because it's like an abused dog when a parent loses a job and moves to a, a city, even though these are very important uses of therapy. Yet, I'm interested in it because structured family therapy is also used when it comes to a change of sexual orientation and gender identity amongst the family member. Now, going back to what I was talking about in the psychology news section, I've actually been trying to get some work experience in gender dysphoria places recently, both at private and at public, and believe me, you learn tons about these places just by researching them, just so you know what to put into your, into your work experience letter. And I like, have I've been researching a whole bunch of like, gender stuff. And I can totally understand why structured family therapy would be brilliant for this difficulty. And all I will say is, it's extremely interesting to see how this works for, works out for a family struggling to accept the sexual orientation of a family member. I would love to see that. I really, really would. It would just be ridiculously fascinating like that to me. How does structured family therapy work? On the whole, the main goal of a stru uh, structural family therapy is to help a, a family change and restructure itself so the family members interact with each other in a way that, that increases their happiness and causes less a conflict in the family system as well as helps them to find more beneficial ways of uh, dealing with uh, stresses that will inevitably pop up in everyday life. One way this that might be done is a uh, is uh, by the therapist commenting that the parents change or adapt to the way they interact with their child, whether their child is dependent on whether the child needs more support or guidance or more independence. Also, they might suggest different strategies for parents so that they can present a united front. Overall, well, this helps to strengthen the family system and this psychological therapy can now go on for a few weeks or months depending on the needs of the family. What should people expect in a structural family therapy? Personally, something I find really interesting about this therapeutic orientation is unlike in other psychological approaches, the therapist is a very active part of the therapy, since the therapists might see adjust things at times. For example, that they might change the format of the session by asking some family members to leave for a moment, by changing the position of family members seated in the room, and that sometimes the therapist suggests that bringing family members behind a one-way mirror so they can watch and observe the conversations of other family members. Now, if I was the person not in, not behind the one-way mirror, and I was the one who was being watched, I would be pooing myself. I would be really, really nervous, and to be honest, I would be absolutely scared. So, but again, that, that's another reason why I think this would be great to watch in real life, uh, just to see how does this, just to see how does this work in. A real world setting. Moreover, there are five main attendants of a structural family therapy. Firstly, there is mapping. This is an effort to understand how a family functions by looking at their structures, patterns, and rules. Therefore, a therapist might draw a, a diagram, write notes to themselves, or get family members to map out the family system for themselves. Secondly, there is joining. This is a process where the therapist gets to know the family and it sets out the expectations of the therapy. This is normally in those questions about the family, an, exp an explanation of the techniques of the therapy and how the therapy and therapist will show support for the family. Thirdly, there is unbalancing. 
This is an interesting element of, of the therapy where the therapist challenges the family member. Of course, this is meant to be confrontational, but to make the family members reconsider their perceptions about how the family operates. But ultimately, you have a reframing. This is a method that structural family therapists use to show the family's various complaints and challenges. Then the therapist will often reframe the problems that they particular individual has because of the structure as well as the patterns of the family dynamics. Finally, there is enactment, which is very important as this is all about the plan for the future. Due to once the family systems and structure has been examined, therapists with the input of the family will introduce different practices and ideas for the family to execute. Conclusion Whilst I will happily say I will never ever have any intention of getting trained up in system theory, it will always hold a special place in my heart. I really do believe in it. I think it has great power and I really would just love to see how this works in real life. And to, and to be honest, we will definitely see this um, at, a, at some point if I will work in mental health services. Since I understand the family system idea, its power and how it can be used to transform the lives of the families for the better. I will never doubt the sheer power of a family therapy and how it can save lives, improve them and stop people from suffering devastating consequences of mental health conditions. Structured family therapy was just a logical next step in my own learning about this therapy and I'm really glad that I have learned about it because it was interesting to see how this therapy encourages change and transformation so that families can thrive. Sometimes our families are chosen, sometimes their blood, but whatever family you have, it is flat out critical. None of us can be successful without our families, so the fact that we have a therapy that helps in the heart family assistance is a great, wonderful, and it certainly impacts individuals and makes them fly high. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I definitely did. Sometimes I think family therapy, wouldn't it be fun to work in? Wouldn't it be fun to try? <laughs> wouldn't it be fun to try out at times? And then I'm just like, no, cognitive behavioural, it's where the jobs are. It's what I truly believe in. I'm definitely more towards that therapeutic orientation. But again, there. The good thing about the UK model is that you always uh, get trained up in two models. So even though I said that in the blog post, I think I fibbed. I think I think uh, when it comes down to it, I think I would like to get trained up in CBT and systemic because they are really, really interesting. And I think they complement each other because like I also said, the systemic theory does not have all of the answers. The cognitive behavioral approach does not have all of the answers, but when you combine the two, that's when you start to hit everything. Well, not everything, but you guys know what I mean. So, really interesting. I loved it, and I really hope that you did too. So, if you know someone who enjoyed today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you want to people help us with the words hey, about the podcast. And if you want to learn more, definitely check out Social Psychology, a guide to social and cultural psychology, available in all of the usual places. And you can become a patron of the show. So have a great day everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please have remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. And if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhiteley.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.